of Ephesians. Then we came down through from verses 8 through 11 last week with the church of Smyrna. And then tonight we take up the church of Pergamos. Let's begin reading down through from verse 12 through verse 17. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not defiled my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, and no man knoweth save he that receiveth it. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you now, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for each of these people that have come out our members of the church and friends that love to study thy word. And Father, we pray that thou would bless them tonight. Bless me as I expound on thy word. Father, I pray that thou would give me liberty, understanding. And Father, might we exalt thy blessed word tonight in thy work. And Father, we'll praise thee. We pray for the many sick in a congregation. Oh God, pray a touch from thy healing hand upon their physical needs. And we'll thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we've been studying on the churches, if you remember how that they began to come down through with the first church beginning back there in about uh, the age right after the apostles, around 95 A.D., and there began to creep in abominable things within the church. Now, it came slowly. And we noticed that the church of... Uh, Ephesus, there was great exhortation, but there was one thing in the sixth verse was the deeds. This is one great thing to come up, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now I went back and taught, as we were teaching on this, how this dealing was a progenitor, I believe, from Nicholas, the apostle, or the, rather the deacon of the apostolate of Antioch, and how that they had begun to try to institute the deeds of those that were usurping the authority of the rule within the church and trying to take over, in a sense, the leadership of the pastorate of the churches. Because he's speaking class, remember, unto the angel, or we go back as we took the time and went through, this angel, the messenger, or the pastor of the church at this time. Now, when he came on down into this church tonight, after they had come down through Smyrna, we find that, that this church was one that had began to have more apostasy and more things moving into it. Now the church age is still moving along. And tonight the church of Pergamos, which we're dealing with, we will find that the deeds of the Nicolaitans develops into a doctrine of the Nicolaitans in this church. Now this church deals with a time along about 313 A.D., dealing along the lines of the time of this church, Pergamos, or meaning married or elevated. And this is dealing during the time of Emperor Constantina. Now, when we begin to study tonight as we come into this church, as I've taken with each church, I want you to notice, first of all, the title of the one speaking unto the church. Now each time this title is the title of Christ. As he spoke being in the first church that we studied on, he said, he writeth these things that holdeth the seven stars in his hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Then when he spoke to the church at Smyrna, he went on and he spoke about these things, right, he that is first and the last, which was dead and which is alive. Now he comes down into verse 12 to the church at Pergamos, 
And here is the title, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now I want you to notice in his title, Sharp Sword with Two Edges. The fact that the word of God, having the two edges, is both an offensive as well as a defensive weapon. The word of God will not be void, and the word of God class both is used in the defense as well as in the offense for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. A person says, you are foolish to go and serve the Lord and going out and leaving your families on Wednesday nights, many of you, and going out to study the Word. Now, God doesn't want that. That's not what God's Word says. The defensiveness of God's Word says laying up treasures in heaven, pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. He said doing that which is right in the sight of God. Now, we could take it by Scripture and go down through this. But it is both an offensive and a defensive weapon. The, the offense, when people come back and they say, I believe that you are all wrong about your plan of salvation. The defense of God's word, as we, even as we preached last Sunday morning, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. God said that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Now, a person can talk about the good works. We can talk about uh, going out here and, uh, and just be, keeping what people call the golden rule. There's no such thing as a golden rule in God's word. There's no place that speaks of the golden rule. Now, people say, well, by the golden rule, I mean do unto others as you'd have done unto yourself. You don't do unto your neighbor as you'd have done unto yourself. Because when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, if we were doing what we were supposed to, and I'm speaking from the preacher right on down, there wouldn't be a neighbor around that would get any sleep tonight until either they come to the Lord Jesus Christ or killed us. Now, that's seriousness. Really, isn't it? When we really think of it, their need to have Jesus. Now, we get over there and we just pester, if I might use that term, and pester them and keep at them. They say, get out, I'm not going to. They throw you out the back door and you run in the back, in the round of the front door and you run back in and say, but you've got to get saved, you need Jesus. Say, get out or I'm going to kill you, but you need Jesus and you're still witness to him. This is what God said when we are redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and realizing that every person without Christ Jesus, what their, their consummation is going to be at the end of this life and such, we would do everything if we loved our neighbor as ourselves. So there's no golden. So we take the word of God. And like I say, it is both defensive as well as an offensive weapon. It has cuts both ways. Now a little bit more. There are the two edges. There is the edge of the law against transgression. By the law, it said that death to the sinner by the law. So the one side of the sword, so to speak, says the law says death against the transgressor. The other side of the, of the sword says that there is an edge of the gospel against despisers of the word. In other words, the transgression of the law of God's word said death and the despisers that reject the gospel message it has said unto them that the gospel message has gone forth that the blood of Jesus Christ the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world has been paid in full despise it if they please they'll die and go to hell you see so the message is both the gospel message of salvation as well as speaking of the condemnation without Christ Jesus. So the sharp sword with two edges. This is the one that's speaking. Now in verse 13 we see his commendation. In verse 13 he tells them of the wonderful things they have done. I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was by my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, in this commendation, thou holdest fast my name. He said that right in the seat of Satan. Now, we know, class, that the fact that the circuit, the circuit of Satan is throughout the world. His ungodliness and reaches out from one end of the world to the other end of the world. 
This is his complete circuit of ungodliness, sin in every place in the world. Because death reigns in every place in the world, and by sin entered death, you see. So we find that he went on, though he spoke of the seat of Satan. Now this is getting down into the seat or the place of which wickedness and error and cruelty dwells in its fullness. Now when you find that the fact that today that some of these areas that are so ungodly and he's speaking about this. At this time, Christ says that you have set right in the midst of this ungodliness which was lifted up and exalted in the place that this church is at that he's speaking of. And yet right in the seat, and right in the place where uh, priestcraft begins to be taught in the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is being taught right in the center of all of this this church is sitting, and he sat in the seat of Satan, and then he spoke of Antipas, my faithful martyr. In other words, these were men like this, and women, if I might use this term in illustration, saints that died for the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ were executed because of their stand for the testimony and the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this place where they were sitting, he said they were not ashamed, even though this was the circumstances of which they set in. In class, if we could just get it within our minds and such, the world today and Christianum of today, born again believers in Christ, say it is foolish to sacrifice for the cause of Christ and to do things that are... are uh, well, hard upon our own physical person, if we might say that at times. When you will exhaust your physical body, so to speak, for the cause of Christ, they say this is foolishness and idiotic. Well, God never changed one thing. God said he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God said at this time people were losing their life for the cause of Christ. Now, there are missionaries and people losing their life today for the cause of Christ, you see. But he spoke of how this was brought even at this time. He said, even though they came and they were slaying the Christians right there for the witness of Christ, he said, still, you did not deny the faith. You did not resist to lift up my name. So he accommodated them for this. They are not ashamed of Christ. Now in verse 14 we find that he begins his complaint against this church. Verse 14, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now we're getting down in to the same movements of today. It's running around this world. I want you to notice he said, Because thou hast there them. There them. Now that's important, those two words. There them. He said, in other words, you have there within your congregation, you have them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, what is the doctrine of Balaam? If you see tonight the doctrine of Balaam, it will help you greatly in understanding what this church was doing. He said, first of all, the fact that when you find the filthiness of the spirit, now I'm speaking of the flesh spirit, the old self spirit, and I'm not speaking about the Holy Spirit, but I'm speaking about when you find the filthiness of this old spirit that dwells within man and find the filthiness of the flesh working together, then you are going to find chaos and debauchery within the realm of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In James chapter 4, James chapter 4 and verse 5. Now I'm going to use my namesake a little bit tonight here. So you hold your finger over there, put a cardboard in it or something, because we'll go back to James uh, a few times back and forth tonight. But in James chapter 4, 
And verse 5, I want you to notice what James said. Chapter 4 and verse 5. He says, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? A lot of people think they're going to walk around and that they are not going to be enticed by the ungodliness of this world, that they are not going to be drawn into hypocrisy and such by dwelling amongst the ungodly and such. But, beloved, James said, Know ye not, or do you think the Scriptures are said in vain, that the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Now, people talk about having the spark of divinity in us. Everybody's brothers in Christ. Now, you know how they teach this, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And that you fan that little old spark of divinity, and pretty soon he'll blossom up into a real good Joe and be on his way to heaven. Well, we know that that is not so. But I'll tell you, you fan the lust of the spirit of the flesh and the filthiness of your flesh, and it will burst into uncorruptedness, or rather corruptibleness, before this world. Why? Because the man without the Lord Jesus Christ class does not have any divinity in him. It's the Holy Spirit that bringeth salvation. And when the Holy Spirit dwells within our heart, then the Word of God, being taught and such, and as we surrender the flesh to the Holy Spirit of God to allow Him to take more and more and more dominion over us, people say, uh, Lord, give me more of the Holy Spirit. That's backwards, class. Give the Holy Spirit more of you. You see, there's the difference. The Holy Spirit dwelleth within us. But how much of our life do we as Christians allow Him to use? You see. But the more we feed on the Word and let the Word saturate us and fill us and separate us onto the things of God, then the more the Holy Spirit, He can use us to reach others and to help others. All right? So we see here that when you get this old filthiness of the flesh and the old filthy spirit of man together, you're going to have trouble. Now, we find that the communion of persons of corrupt principles and of corrupt practice of ungodliness, you'll find that that's going to draw the uh, a guilt or a blemish on the entire church. That's what he's talking about. He said, I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them which hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, in the corruptness that begins to move in, in other words, the world moving into the church. Now, some people's feelings get hurt at times when they've called me about this or that or the other thing. I'm speaking about people calling like they called me and wanted to know they said, uh, I understand that your church will support and finance the y, uh, YMCA uh, uh, boys softball team. I said, well, no, I'm sorry. We don't, uh, we don't support uh, a church team like, or a team like that. And she said, are you going to deprive these little boys of having an opportunity to play? I said, no, ma'am. I said, I'll be glad if my church doesn't want to do it. I'll do it out of my own pocket. Uh, I will finance this ball team, providing that every player does attend our Sunday school and our morning preaching service. Oh, well, we can't do that now. Now, these, some of these go to church. Some of them go to the Catholic church. Some go here and there. Trying to bring the world into the church. Our whole promotion is to win men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and she said, well, I, uh, you're not concerned about these little boys not being able to play ball. I said, madam, I'm concerned about these little boys and girls going to hell without the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as their moms and dads. Now, some say, why, that preacher's just so hard-hearted and cold-hearted. She told me the other churches supported them last year, and they told me you'd support them. How, why, how come they told me that you would support this Baseball, I said, I don't know. Ma'am, we're not ecumenicalists. Somebody else don't tell us how to run our church. And she said, well, I don't understand this. I said, well, the work of, our, of the church is to support the work of God and to win men and women, boys and girls, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they said that, that was just so hard for that one to understand. Now, I get calls like this a lot of times. 
somebody's wanting to come in and do some big thing before the church that they think would be real sweet. Now supposing that we spent an hour of sweetness and there sat lost souls there and there and there and there and they walked out that door without the Lord Jesus Christ and the rapture took place that afternoon and here I'd stand as a pastor with their blood dripping from my hands before the judgment seat of Christ because I allowed the world instead of the gospel message to go forth. So we find that the fact as I've used before, you get out in a boat. Now there's nothing wrong with taking that boat out there in, into the water and rolling it around. But if you do like Harold Schultz done, then you're in trouble when he didn't put his plugs in and the water got all in the boat and the boat was sinking, that's all wrong. I couldn't resist that, Harold. Excuse me. <laughs> but the illustration that I was wanting to get at, the boat and the water is fine, but when the water's in the boat, then you got trouble. The church in the world is fine, but when the world's in the church, it's all wrong. And this is what he's talking about. He said, they have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, let's go on down to this doctrine of Balaam. Doctrine of Balaam was this. It was committing spiritual fornication and false teachers and uh, the fornication of the actual flesh outside of the doctrine of which God had set forth for marriage. And many times people come, I get calls on that too. Will you marry me and my dearly beloved? And I'll ask them. So I talk with them. Maybe the one's a Christian, you see. And I'll say, is, is your fiancé a Christian? Well, no. Now, I can't marry a saved and a non-saved. God said, be ye not unevenly yoked. Now, the answer comes back. They say, well, I don't see what business that is of yours. I cannot do it. God called me and ordained me and set me in as a pastor. And when I perform a wedding, I am putting the approval of my ordination of God upon that wedding, in a sense to speak. Now, if I am going to marry a saved and an unsaved, I am yoking up an unevenly matched couple. And God said it is wrong, and I will not do it. I cannot. The Bible says I'm not to do it. Therefore, this doctrine of Balaam, this run along this line. Now let's go back and see what old Balaam was doing here. Back in the 25th chapter of the book of Numbers. And you watch this class. This is the same thing that's running along today. What is President Johnson's daughter uh, doing right now? She is taking catechism classes of the Roman Catholic Church in order to marry a Roman Catholic. Now, I've run into this already. I'm beginning to talk to somebody. Well, I don't see nothing wrong with, with the Catholic. You know, after all, President Johnson's daughter is marrying a Roman Catholic. Yeah, that's right. But what did God's Word say? What did God's Word say? See, there's the difference. But they came along. Now this is the way they begin to work. Satan working the same way. Watch. 25th chapter of the book of Numbers, verses 1 through 3. And Israel abode in Chittim, and the people began to commit wardom with the daughters of the Moabs. Now, they were ordered and forbidden to marry any Moabites or Amorites or Hittites. They were forbidden by God to marry a Moabite. You say that uh, in the world comes along and says, well, it doesn't make any difference. God told Israel, don't you marry outside of an Israelite. And Israel, the type of God's redeemed people. Saved to marry a saved. Now, he said in verse 2, And they called the people unto the sacrifice. Who did? The Moabs called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal, Peror, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Now, here's what they done. They come along, 
An unsaved person's desires and heart is to serve their gods of the flesh in the world. And when the unsaved get mixed up with the ungodly, they are going to take them out and they are going to bow down before their gods and they are going to worship and serve their gods, the gods of silver and stone and idols and wood that have hands that touch not, ears that hear not, eyes that see not, mouths that speak not, feet that move not. The gods of the flesh of this world, you see. So we find how they've spoken about this is the doctrine of Balaam starting out here. Now let's go a little bit further with Balaam. Over in Numbers chapter 31. Numbers chapter 31. And verses... Well, let's take from Numbers 31, uh, verses 15. I had to turn over. I flipped. <laughs> I looked at that again. When I flipped over, I got cleared over in Deuteronomy. It flipped right to Deuteronomy chapter 31. I thought, my goodness, I, I pulled a boner. I got the wrong scripture. But I was just in the wrong book. I'll get back with you in a minute. All right. In Numbers chapter 31, and we'll take verses 15 and 16. And Moses said unto them... Have ye saved all the women alive? Now, let me give you what took place. In the 31st thir first chapter here, this ungodliness had been going out, and the defilement was coming along, and finally God said to Moses, He said, Moses, get you some men out of the tribes there, and I want you to go down against the Midianites, and these women that had, were progenerators from the Moabs, and He said, I want you to go down there, and I want you to slay all the men and take them into captivity, and then he told them to slay every woman that knew man, or in other words, that had conceived of man, every one of those women that were brought into the captivity were to be slain, that were with child, and every male child was to be slain. All oh, people talk about all the great love so much today. They say, you're, you're so, so hard about this salvation, and so on and so forth. Beloved God set down his precepts, and we are to follow them. A man told me the other day, he said, well, I think you're a little bit uh, narrow-minded. I said, that's right, I am. Man, I'm as narrow-minded as can be. Because God said, straight and narrow is a road that leadeth to life everlasting, and few there be that enter therein. Broad and wide is a road that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that enter therein. Satan's got plenty of room to get down through there with. But they're going to have to look down the straight line of the Lord Jesus Christ's blood of salvation in order to enter heaven. Sure, I'm narrow-minded. Who was it? They gave Bob Dunning one time a little old piece of paper about that wide and about that long. And they said, here's a scratch pad for narrow-minded preachers. Well, praise the Lord. They can give me the scratch pad because I am narrow-minded. But look what God said. And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespasses. Trespasses. Trans Transgressations. <laughs> I'll just change it. Trans trespasses. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. All right. Trespasses. <laughs> I couldn't get it on. Against the Lord in the matter of Pelor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Why? These women caused it. They began to marry in to them that God has said to forbid them. Let's go a little bit further. God had warned them, and God had warned Balaam. Over in the 22nd chapter of Numbers, I won't be able to read all of it, but if you just take down your notes in the 22nd chapter of Numbers and just take the chapter right down through the 27th verse, from 1 right down through 27, you'll get a good picture of what was taking place. Now here is where they had talked to the Medians. In verse 4, And Moab said unto the elders of the Medians, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, and the ox licketh up the grass of the fields. And Balak, the son of Zophar, was king of the Moabites at that time. Now here's what he done. He sent down, I'll just talk you through part of it, but he sent down to Balaam, 
And he said, Balaam, come on up here and I am going to give you great riches if you will go out and you will curse the children of Israel. Now, Balaam went up and talked to him. And we find in verse 8, And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab, Moab abideth with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto him, Balak, the son of Zophar, king of the Moabite, Moabs, has sent, me unto, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth, Come now, curse them, now curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and divide them out. Now in other words, here's what he said. He said the Jews, he what come up out of Egypt, the Jew. He said God's people. He said he wants me to come over there and give them a curse and put a curse upon them so that he can come and drive them out of the land. They're just taking over all the land. You know, and he wants to drive them out. Now I want you to notice, class, in verse 12 you see God's gives out here in that 12th verse, he gives his directive will. His direct will. Watch what he said in verse 12. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. All right, Balaam went back to the king and he said, I, I can't bless him, God, or curse him. God said, I didn't want me to curse him. I'm not going to be able to do it. He even went on down... And uh, he said, even if you gave me this entire house filled with silver and gold, I still couldn't do it. So after he said this, we find that he come on down in verse 19. Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may ask that the Lord will say unto me more. Now I said, uh, I'll just go back up here and I'll talk to the Lord a little bit more about this. Maybe I can get an approval. Well, you're going to see in verse 20, we see God's permissive will. He gave him a permissive will to go ahead and do what he wanted to do. He didn't give him a will. He knew what God's will was. God distinctly told him in verse 12, you're not to curse these people. They are blessed. But he wouldn't listen. He run back up there. And, and he said, well, I'd like, I'd like to go, God, and so on and so forth. So verse 20, And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. You say, oh, but God said for him to go. No, he hadn't. You watch. Man and woman is a free moral agent. You can choose to follow God or you can choose to forsake God. You can choose to come to salvation or you can choose to reject salvation. You can choose to serve God or you can choose to deny God. You can choose to go on and do that which God would have you to do or you can choose to disgruntle against God. You are a free moral agent. Now God said to him, God had already told him what his will was. He said, all right. Came unto Balaam at night, said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. Well, he's going to walk along here a little bit with the ungodly, so he got up and went with them. You see what's coming in? The separation is being knocked down by what Balaam is doing. So he comes on, on out here and notice that in verse 21, And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab, and God's anger was kindled because he went and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. Now I'm, I'm not going to be able to go down through this. But here's what happened now. You see what's taking place? He said, I'll get a lot of silver and gold if I'll curse God's people. And God said, don't you curse them, they're blessed. So he runs back and he said, I can't even, I can't even curse them, Moab, even though you give me a whole house of silver and gold. Well, I'd like to have you go along with us and uh, go up here and, and see what, maybe you could help me along a little bit anyhow. You know, that communicable. Well, let's just walk along again. It don't mean you have to do everything I do. Yeah. God said, come, you help me separate. 
So we find that he went back up to God in a sense and saying, God, do you, do you really mean that I can't go and take that gold and silver? And uh, I'm, I'm living a little bit, but just let me put just a little bitty curse on him. I can probably get about 10,000 for it. Just a little bitty curse. God said, if they come again, you go ahead and go. But you know what I said you had better do. He refused to obey God. He went on and used his free will. All right? God even went down to the point. He didn't have a prophet out there to talk to him. He didn't have a preacher to send over there to him to talk to him. So what did he do? Old Balaam saddled up his ass, took off. God put an angel of the Lord, stood right in the pathway. And old Balaam was so spiritually blinded that he couldn't see the servant of the Lord standing there. But that old dumb ass could see him. And, he, and, and the old donkey started to turn to try to get around it. And Balaam got mad when he moved over and he crushed his foot against the side of the wall. He got off and he just started beating the stuffings out of that old donkey and, and got back onto it and started out again, you know. And the, the, the angel of the Lord just kept getting him down pin more and more and more until pretty soon the donkey and his fear and such rolled right over on him. God done everything he could to stop him from going and going against the will that he told him to do. He done everything he could. Listen. God tries to talk to us many times. You won't listen to him. He, there's things that come up in our life. When something happens, I start searching. You notice that that's what the disciples done. And God said, one of you, Jesus said, one of you will deny me. Right away, old Peter said, I, Lord. And here they went, right down the road. So pretty soon, old Judas Iscariot sitting over there. Everybody else, the other 11, and said, is it I? So pretty soon he said, Lord, is it I? Or, no, excuse me. I said, Lord. He said, Master. He never called him, Lord. Is it I? Lord said, thou say. Thou know, see. See what I'm getting at? When he come on down there, God had done everything he could to stop Balaam from doing this. And not only that, but now I, I, this is something I don't understand. I think about this. God went right on down to the point that the old donkey turned around and started talking to him. And Balaam argued with him. Now, I'll tell you, I'm afraid if I, if I were out here in the middle of a field riding along a donkey, and he rolled over and I got mad and I kicked the stuff out of him, so I pretty soon he turned around and started talking to me, I, I think I'd, I'd either run or start listening or something. But he didn't. He argued with him. And then the angel of the Lord revealed himself. But I don't have time to go all the way through this. But you see, he was determined that he was going to defile the children of Israel and break down their separation. And that's exactly what he was going to do. God had warned him. God told him what to do. And he went and done it anyhow. But I want you to see how that old Balaam, Balaam chose his self-will, chose his self-advantage. He took his own free board agent, done what he wanted, and he was killed at the hands of the Israelites. God had warned him. Over in that 31st chapter of Numbers here, you'll find over in chapter 31 and verse 8, when God got ready to take vengeance, God sent him down there to, to, to slay all them men. Remember, as I was speaking of, of the Midianites and such. And when they went down there, old Balaam was out there with the rest of those men where he didn't belong and such. And God, those men slew him right along with the rest of them. Reaped what he sowed. All right? Now, you notice that the defilement of the children of Israel is the same thing as this church that God was talking about. You followed and you've allowed them there that teach the doctrine of Balaam that do not teach separation but knock down separation and say do as you please in a sense. And you've let them into the church and you have not stopped it. When it came in, you have not stood against it. So he says you're defiling the separation from the world. And we find that he said in James chapter 4, and this time I want James chapter 4 and verse 4. James chapter 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the fellow friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. You want to go out and hoochie-coochie around out there on, on that old bebop dance floor? You are being a friend of the world, and God says that is enmity against him. You want to go out and sit, I'm saying you, uh, I'm speaking of bringing it out, what he's speaking about. You want to live 
and people want to live in the world and say that they are a follower of Christ and God says that the fellowship of the world is enmity with God and when you want the world into the churches of God you are bringing in the doctrine of Balaam and are denouncing the truth of God's blessed infallible word and the wrath of God will be upon it. So you see this separational point that God has set down. Now I want you to notice again there with that church at Pergamos as he goes on down, he said that Balaam had cast this stumbling block out in the children of Israel and they had caused them to eat things sacrificed unto idols to commit fornication. Then we get down into verse 15. He's still saying what he has against them. So hast thou, and notice again, so hast thou also them, also them. Verse 14, it said there, them. Verse 6, 15 says also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now fasten down your safety belt. Thou hast also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. What was coming in? Priestcraft and denouncing of the local autonomous of the church. They were setting up headquarters over the church. And that is the same thing that they have in the Vatican Council over Catholicism and had at that time tried to reach out and squash down the churches of the independent work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the same thing you have in denominational headquarters hierarchy over the local entity of the church. It's the same thing you have in conventionism over the headquarters of a church. I care not what name it carries. It is hierarchying and domineering over the local entity of the church. And God said, Jesus said, which thing I hate. The local autonomous was being done away with. And God says this is a debauchery. The beginning of the priestcraft. That's what they brought in. Remember how Constantina had said, I am taking over as head of the churches and they are going to do and be in subjection unto the things that I am going to set out. I am the emperor and the head of the church. And they tried to force the other. That's where your name came in, my friend. People come along and say, you don't have a Bible name. You ever hear them say that? Church of Christ come along and they'll say, well, we got a Bible name. The Bible tells you in there, the churches of Christ salute you. <laughs> well, I don't have time to teach you on that. But you know where you got your name? If you're a true fundamental Bible-believing independent local entity Baptist? You got it right back there with Constantina. And when the hierarchy set in, what happened? They said, well, we'll baptize for salvation. Yeah, that's where they started bringing it in, back in about the third century, approximately. We'll baptize for salvation. The true local church stood up and said, we will not have no part in it. You must be born again of the Spirit of Christ. And they said, you are anti-baptist. You're against baptismal regeneration. To that I say amen and amen. But when they brought this out, this is where they started it, you see. So actually the name started because they said you are anti-Baptist. Then later on, in later parts of the centuries as it came along, they dropped, dropped the anti and just left them called Baptist. I did not ever claim or try to claim that we derived our name from John the Baptist. I believe he's a good Baptist preacher. But that is not where we try to derive a name. They say you can't show me a Baptist church in the scripture, no. Not by name, but I can show you them there by doctrine. I don't care what the name you put over it. It's a doctrine that tells what it is. The reason I say I'm a Baptist, and you have to go all the way through it. I have to stand up and somebody will say, what kind of a Baptist are you? <laughs> you think I'm a four-headed one. I say I'm an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, premillennial, local entity. Uh, rapture will be taking place one of these days and calling this church out. The revelation part of it will be when Jesus steps back upon the Mount of Olives and the Mount of Olives opens forth and therefore will be the great valley of Jehoshaphat where he'll gather all nations for the judgment of the Gentile nations. And after the Gentile nations are being judged and gathered together and the goat have been cast into the lake of fire and those on the righteous on the right hand have been brought into the millennial prepared for thee from the kingdom of the foundations 
kingdoms of the world and at the end of the millennial kingdom of 1,000 years when Satan has been loosed from the bottomless pit and has come and compressed the camp of the saints round about and God has rained down fire and brimstone from heaven and has consumed Satan and the world is purged by fire and eternity begins and the white throne judgment takes place and God casts all the unsaved, unredeemed, unregenerated that refuse to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and have cast them into the lake of fire, both body and soul, which burneth with fire and brimstone forever and ever. And the ages and the eons of God are set up at that time. That's what comes back to sign. And that's about what you got to go through. Why? <laughs> Sounds silly, but we get all the documents. But this, this class is what I'm getting. No longer does the mean, name mean anything in a sense. But like I'm saying, I'm still a Baptist from the top of my head to the balls of my feet. Some say you're a Baptist and a half. All right, I'm a Baptist and a half then. But I'm a Bible-believing, born-again child of God, scripturally baptized by the authority of the local entity, and live and teach the counsel of God, 66 books compiled by holy men of old, by better than 44 authors that compiled the blessed book that the Holy Spirit gave them witness and that they set forth as holy men of old as the Holy Spirit moved upon them. And I believe, as the Bible has said, in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, that the man of God might be truly furnished unto all good work. So we find, class, that the Bible spoke of, the local entity. Now he says they started bringing in this doctrine. What, how did it start? He says, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine. I'm going to have to move along, Brother Baker. You got, your tape's going to run out of fudge. <laughs> All right. Let's go on down now. We find that God has went on spoken, speaking here of how... <laughs> spoken. <laughs> I'm an awful shake tonight, aren't I? <laughs> All right. But he went on speaking here about how in verse 6 that doctrine was a deed. Or it was a deed then. And then in verse... Uh, here in the chapter, in the 16th verse, it became a doctrine of the Nicolaiteans. Now, verse 16, class, notice verse 16 closely. The first three words should stir our minds. Repent or else. Repent or else. Oh, how God's people need to learn this. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And what is it? The word of God. And God said, for apostasy, in other words, for falling away and for disagreement uh, uh, with the Word of God and forsaking the Word of God, God said, for apostasy, you'll find there's only one remedy, and that is judgment. Judgment. The children of Israel rebelled. Judgment fell. The early churches... Came along so far, if they didn't get straight, local entities that had forsaken and begin to drop out, judgment fell. God said, if you will not repent, he's spoken of this through these churches also. He said, I will come and take the candlestick out of the holder. In other words, he said, I will come and take the power of the Holy Spirit out of the church. Now let me clarify that. The Holy Spirit dwells within our body, born again believers in Christ. But what he's speaking about is as a church, such as we are here, if God is not empowering the message and empowering the church, and we're in prayer and supplication unto God through the power of the Holy Spirit, then our preaching, our teaching, our gathering is in vain. And when souls aren't being saved, then the power of God is not there. That's all there is to it. Now, I know we don't have souls saved every week. We waited for a long time. Then they got a little harder picking. Now, praise be unto God, we've had, what, 15 saved this, this year thus far. But after about three dry Sundays, I was climbing a wall. <laughs> I was really getting disturbed. Why? There, it doesn't make any difference, class, how much we gather together and talk about Jesus if we are not winning souls, then we are not doing the work of the church. The job is to win souls. 
Oh, I better get going. So he says, repent or else. Now I want you to notice this. A church or any particular persons that sin together should repent together. In James chapter 3 and verse 16, he said, For where envy and or strife and envy is, there is confusion and every evil work. If we're walking together, we must be together in accordance as God has set forth. And without this, a church or people are not going to be walking hand in hand for Jesus. Then the fact is that sinning together must repent together. Churches should be in prayer and supplication together. Now we teach the word of God. Now I realize that also here's two things. Let me say you can pray in your home hour on end, but you cannot study Bible together hour on end. Now let me clarify this. I want to say this very carefully, lest anyone should think that I'm shooting at anyone with this statement. I'm bringing out a point. I want the church to understand. It'll help us. In prayer and supplication. Now we gather together in prayer. In adoration. Now we should be in prayer. You know, half the time when I'm teaching and preaching, as fast as I go, you probably couldn't hardly believe it, but I'm still praying at the same time. I'll sit talking with somebody, looking right at him, dealing with him, and I'm praying at the same time. The Bible says, lifting up holy hands in supplication and prayer always before God. And remember that pray. I drive down the road talking to the Lord. Somebody drive by. One of these days you may have to come and bail me out. Somebody going to come and get me and put me in a white jacket and run me off somewhere. Well, if you do, you just testify for me. He was out there praying. You know, that's what they wanted to do with him in, in the book of Acts. Because they were glorifying God, praying, and they said they're drunk. <laughs> Peter said, no, they're not. He said, God has filled them and blessed them. You see? So we find that on this point he said, Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly. I want to give you another point on this. When God comes to punish the corruption and comes to punish corrupt members of a church, he's going to also rebuke the church for allowing such things to continue in the communion of the church. Repent or else. Now, we'll find that without repentance, some of the drops of God's wrath storm is going to fall on the whole church. You mark it down. Except church repent and turn, when the wrath of God's storm comes down, the drops are also going to hit the whole church. You can find it throughout the scriptures. Now, we find that God is going to take hold of sin. He's going to take hold of sin either for conviction or for confession, one or the other. In James chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now brothers and sisters, we walk round about, and just think of how much sin we commit. To know to speak to that person and tell them about Jesus, not to do it, God said it's sin. To know to pray and not do it, God said it's sin. To know to read your Bible and not do it, God said it's sin. To know to give honor to the Lord and not do it, God said it's sin. To know God said to be baptized and not do it, God says it's sin. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. The Word of God declares. Now, I want to move along because I want to complete this church out. Verse 17 will bless you. Do you notice how he does this? He gives his title, his accommodations, what they've done good. Then he comes down and he gives his complaint. And then in verse 16, as we just had it, he gave his counsel what to do. And now in verse 17, he gives his promise. Verse 17, he gives his promise. He that hath and hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. Pondered a lot on this verse. This really blessed you. He said, 
in this in his promise to him that will hear the word of God. In other words, the comfort of the spirit of Christ, this manna. Now we find the manna, remember that in the ark, of the covenant, as I taught on the tabernacles, and in the Ark of the Covenant, in the bottom of the Ark, uh, in later years that they had put the golden pot of manna, the manna, the bread of life that came down the type of Christ. Now it was in the bottom of the Ark, in the Holy of Holies. Now the only one that could take the top of the Ark off, the mercy seat off, was was Moses when it was set up. Now, he speaks of the hidden manna. In other words, hear what he's talking about, that you'll find the only person that's going to get the hidden manna is that which is hid in the salvation of Christ Jesus and him that will reach up by faith and ask God to save them and give them life in Christ Jesus. Then comes forth the manna, the living manna, the bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when he does, when this is taken place, then he went on and he said, the fact that this hidden has been hidden until that heart is opened unto the Lord. And then notice, it said, and I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. You know what that means? Bless you. Ancient history will teach it to you. The white stone. Back years ago, well back in, in ancient time, they used to take a criminal and they put him on trial. And when that trial was completed, they came over and they put a stone in his hand. If it were a white stone... It meant that he was found acquitted. If it was a black stone, it meant he was condemned to execution. Jesus said, I will give him a white stone. Absolution from the guilt of sin. When he receives the Lord Jesus Christ, the manna from heaven, the condemnation upon his sin-sick soul, of going to death into hell, the wages of sin is death, said Romans 6, 23. The white stone says, but he has the gift of God, which is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. I will give unto him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name written. A new name written. We could go back and take the great stone, the great rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, upon which our new name was written down in glory, upon the rock of our salvation. But we find that this rock of ages, that we glorify our King, the Lord Jesus. But we find here the fact that the new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth. And I'll give you the scriptures, because I want to close out. But Isaiah 56, 5, God has spoken about how he would give us a name, like we've never known before. In Isaiah 56, chapter 5, or chapter 56 and verse 5. Even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Now, we will be called the sons of God in the new name. John chapter 1, or 1 John, rather 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, Behold what matter of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew not him. He has a name written on the stone that no man knoweth, saving he that received it. In fact, the world does not know our heavenly Father and laughs and doesn't know him and cannot see him. But we that have received him as our personal Savior, we know him and know that our name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life. No man knoweth, saving he that received it. The world don't know it, but we know it, don't we? Praise the Lord by his blessed work. Next week... We'll take the next church.